So the aim of this podcast is to give you the opportunity to practice calculating some integrals using the Leibniz integral rule. And there are three questions. And the first one gives you an integral and says, from this, obtain a different integral. And the other two are just integrals with a parameter and using a slightly different approach, but also based on the Leibniz integral rule, uh, you should try to calculate these two integrals. So what you have to do is write down the integrals, use pen and paper to solve them, don't look at the rest of the video, and then afterwards you can come back and look at the answers. And in the instructions on YouTube, there will be links to the, where the answers are for each of the three separate questions. So with that, start to try to do the questions and stop looking at the video. Welcome back. So let's move on to the answers to the first question. So in the first question, we are given this integral. Um, the indefinite version of this integral is, by the way, a very standard integral. It is an arc tangent and you just put in the limits and this is the result you get. But what we can do now is to calculate the integral that we're asked to obtain, which is written down here at the end, we recognize that if we differentiate this with respect to the parameter a that's in here, we are going to increase the power of this on the bottom. So let's do that and just see what comes out. So we're going to differentiate this. We take the derivative with respect to a through the integral sign. That's what the Leibniz integral rule tells us to do. So in here we have a squared plus x squared to the power of minus 1. We bring that power out in front. That's the minus 1. And then we reduce the power from minus 1 to minus 2. So that is 1 over a squared plus x squared all squared. And then, of course, what we have to do from the chain rule is to multiply by the derivative of the argument of the brackets with respect to a. We're differentiating with respect to a. So from that, we would get a factor of 2a plus 0. So that's the 2a that's outside here. If this is equal to this, the derivative of this with respect to a is equal to the derivative of this with respect to a. So this is pi over 2 times a to the minus 1. So when we differentiate it again, we're going to pull a minus sign in front, and the power of minus 1 becomes a power of minus 2. So this is our new result. And to simplify things and to find this integral here, we can cancel the minus signs on both sides. And we want to divide here by 2a, so that we're just left with 1 over a squared plus x squared squared. And putting another factor of 2a here, when we divide by 2a, we have a pi. 2 times 2 is 4, and a squared times a becomes a cubed. And this is our answer for the first integral. So let's move on and look at the next problem. So the second problem looks slightly different. We have, again, it's a definite integral. And there is a parameter a in this argument here. So this integral is a function of a. It is not a function of x because x here is a dummy variable that is being integrated over. So if we differentiate both sides with respect to a, we're going to get a new relationship. And let's see if that's helpful. So if we differentiate this side with respect to a, we get this. This is the derivative of what the integral is as a function of a. And on this side, again, using the Leibniz integral rule, we take the derivative through the integral and we differentiate this. And we have 0, because this does not depend upon a, minus the derivative of this with respect to a, differentiating this with respect to a is going to pull a factor of minus x in front. Minus minus becomes plus, and there is a factor of x times e to the minus ax. And the factor of 1 over x that is multiplying everything, of course, is pulled through the derivative with respect to a, so that just effectively sits there. So the derivative 
with respect to a of our result for the integral is going to be given by this. And at this stage we're quite pleased because here the x on the bottom, which is what made this a difficult looking integral, is now going to cancel with that x. So this and this cancel and that means that we are left with the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus ax. And although that's an improper integral, it is one that we know converges because e to the minus ax, since a is positive, is going to fall off fast as x becomes large. So the derivative with respect to a of the result we want is given by the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus ax, that's just this, and that's a straightforward integral. We're performing the integral with respect to x, so we're also going to have an exponential e to the minus ax, and you can see easily if you differentiate this with respect to x, you would pull a factor of minus a in front, the minus and the minus cancel, the a over the a here would cancel, and we would indeed get e to the minus ax. So this is the correct result for the indefinite integral. Here are our limits. We put the limits in. As x goes to infinity, this will go to 0. And when x goes to 0, we'll have e to the naught. So we have naught from the upper limit minus, open brackets, minus 1 over a here, e to the naught, which is just 1. So we have minus minus is plus 1 over a. So this is our result for the derivative with respect to the parameter a of the result we want for the whole integral. Now the good news is that this is a very simple function of a, so we can integrate it with respect to a. So the result we want is the integral of this with respect to a here. The integral of 1 over a is of course just the natural logarithm of a, plus an unknown integration constant. So the question is, can we fix the integration constant through looking at our initial formula and considering a value of a? So we come back, we look at our starting line, and the thing that I hope jumps out at you is, well, if a was equal to 1, we'd have e to the minus x minus e to the minus x in other words, we'd have 0 in the numerator. So coming down here, I've written this. In our starting line, if a is 1, then f of 1, the thing we want for the value when a is 1, would be the integral of 0 over x, and that integral will, of course, be 0. So this tells us, coming back to our relationship here, that when a is 1, this must vanish. So if a is 1, we have f of 1, which must vanish, is equal to the log of 1, which is 0, plus our unknown integration constant. So that tells us the integration constant is 0. So this means that our integral, the thing that we're looking for, which is equal to f of a, has a very simple form. It is just the logarithm of a. So what we did in this case, was we looked at the integral, we said there's a parameter here, if we differentiate with respect to the parameter, does that make the integrand become simpler? And the good news was, yes, it did. It gave us a very easy integral to calculate. And then we had a nice simple result for the derivative of the result we wanted with respect to a. So then we integrated that with respect to a. There was an unknown integration constant, but we were able to fix the integration constant because this integral had a very simple form. It vanished for a particular value of a. So that gave us all the information we needed to find the integration constant, which in this case vanished. And therefore, this, without that, because it vanishes, was our result for the integral. So with that we'll go on look at the answer to the third question. So the third exercise is somewhat similar to the second one in the quiz. 
we have to calculate a definite integral and there is a parameter in the integrand and I'm going to say that the result for this integral which is going to depend on the parameter is some function capital F of the parameter. This is not an easy integral to perform directly because of the logarithm on the bottom and it's perhaps initially not obvious how that might be got rid of but the point is that if you want to differentiate this with respect to lambda then through the Leibniz integral rule we would pull it through the integral sign and we'd want to differentiate x to the power of lambda with respect to lambda and to do that what we do is we write x to the power of lambda as e to the log of x to the power of lambda use the rules for logs to pull the lambda out in front so we realize that x to the lambda can be written as e to the lambda log of lambda and that's a form which is straightforward to differentiate with respect to lambda so let's differentiate both sides here this is the result we want so the derivative of it with respect to lambda is we pull the derivative through the integral sign we're going to differentiate this, which is the only place that lambda occurs. So we're going to differentiate here e to the lambda log x. So when we do that, e to the lambda log x stays there as a factor, but we pull a factor of log of x out in front. So we have log of x e to the log of x times lambda here, minus 0, because that's the derivative of 1 all divided by log of x and at this stage we are smiling because we see that we have a log of x in the numerator and a log of x in the denominator and they cancel. So what we see is that the derivative of the result we want is the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the lambda log x dx. And what we do to integrate that now with respect to x is we rewrite that just using this result here as x to the lambda and if we are integrating this with respect to x lambda is being treated as a constant so this is a straightforward integral it is x to the lambda plus 1 and then we divide by this new power lambda plus 1 and this is calculated between our limits of from 0 to 1. So when x is 1, we have 1 in the numerator of a lambda plus 1. And when x is 0, we have 0 here, so that will just vanish. I'm not even going to write it down. So our result for the derivative of the integral with respect to lambda is 1 over lambda plus 1. At this stage, everything goes very much as it did in the previous example. We integrate with respect to lambda, and we obtain the result we want. This is again, fortunately, easy to integrate with respect to lambda. We have the logarithm of lambda plus 1. And of course, there will be an additive integration constant. So now, we need to find what this constant is. And to do that, we go back and we look at the starting line and we think, well, if lambda was equal to 0, we would have x to the naught, which is 1, and 1 minus 1 vanishes. So when lambda is equal to 0, we are integrating over 0 and the whole function will vanish. So we need our integration constant to be such that f of naught is equal to naught. So let's put a naught into here, so that must vanish. And here we have the logarithm of naught plus 1, log of 1. The logarithm of 1 is, of course, 0 plus c. So we have 0 is 0 plus c. So again, this tells us that the integration constant in this example has also got to vanish. So the result we want for the integral is therefore just going to be the logarithm of lambda plus 1. And that is the result written here. So, what did we do here? This was very much like the second exercise. The only thing was that we realized that to differentiate x to the lambda, what we had to do was to rewrite x to the lambda as e to the log of x to the lambda. 
And then later on, when we wanted to integrate this with respect to x, we turned it back and rewrote it as x to the lambda because this is straightforward to integrate with respect to x because now the power is a constant. So I hope this has helped give you some feedback on your understanding of the Leibniz integral rule and how to calculate certain types of integrals. And with that, I'll stop this video.